Welcome to my talk about the MBS plugin. Let's see. Um, as you may know, I, I'm making plugins for 18 years now. It's a lot of fun, um, helping a lot of people. I mean, and as long as the community buys a license from time to time, uh, I can continue. So I don't need to get a real job. <laughs> So let's let's show you a few things uh, I have. Um, well, it, it's like you, you have a hobby, you have a hobby, and you just get money for it. Someone asked me uh, yesterday about uh, to get memory statistics on Megos uh, to know how much memory is free or in use. So I made a function to query a. Fu um, function for, for them and uh, it creates the uh, host statistics so you get a lot of numbers. I may need to tell you a little bit about the numbers. So first all the numbers are in pages. A page is 16k of memory and uh, so the page size is, is one of the properties here, so 16. Okay so we have the free count, it's the number of pages free right now. If someone needs memory, they can have that memory directly. There's the active count. That's how many pages are in use by applications currently or have been used within the last seconds. So the system keeps a, a reference to which pages were touched recently. A page of memory is a, a little memory allocation of 16 kilobytes. So this is all in 16 kilobyte units. It used to be 4 kilobytes on Intel machines, but for ARM they switched to 16, so they need a little bit less overhead for managing them. So inactive pages, pages that haven't been used recently, those can be moved to swap if needed to make free memory available. Then you have a wire count, that is the pages which are wired down, which means they can't be swapped out. This may, may be uh, memory for, for managing the pages, this may be memory for the kernel itself, memory for a virtual machine, because that can't be wired out too. Then we have zero fill count, that are pages someone allocated, um, but they didn't get physical memory right away, they just get a page that is all zeros. So, and Technically, all zero pages are just one page in memory. They just point all to the same page. And when you modify the page, it gets a copy on white fault. So when someone tries to write it, they get a copy of that page. <coughs> and then they really get physical, physical memory. So page in, page out, that's what your swap is about. Should be zero, otherwise, uh, if it's not zero, please buy more memory. <laughs> You really want to avoid that. Um, then you have purge able, that's memory that can be freed because it has been in use for caching, for example, and uh, it could be swap, it could just be purged because it can be recreated. Like it uh, could be memory um, from um, loaded from a uh, executable. Like the, if you have an application, the blocks from the application are mapped into memory, so they are loaded, but they could be discarded at any time and then reloaded if needed. And then you also have compressed thing, uh, compressed memory, because before Megos uh, swaps out to disk, it, uh, it compresses memory. And this new function uh, for the upcoming version will give you all the numbers, so you know how much memory is free, how much how the memory pressure is. And this could help you uh, querying statistics like um, I saw an uh, example database uh, checking every every minute or so on the server to know the memory statistics. Yeah. Um, this function is available without any permission check. Uh, it's just querying statistics from the kernel. We usually have the problem on Linux uh, that such information is not available without root, so you often have to go back to running a shell 
to run a command line utility that can read data from the kernel space. So, but this is coming and I knew. Then there's another thing I, I wanted to show you. Um, I had a question about MQTT. So that's about um, yeah, a messaging queue protocol where um, you have a server and the server gets messaging messages pushed from different sources and then you can <coughs> subscribe to a topic and uh, yeah, receive the messages. Could be anything. I mean, it's just about getting messages together and pushing them out to everyone interested. And here's a, a test server I found and we can connect to it and uh, then we are listening and we can send something and I could also um, send something with a, with a um, terminal. Let's say I... Um, yeah, yeah. So just take the URL, tell girl to send something, um, let's say hello, um, and you see it arrives here. So for that um, I had to make a few changes to the plugin. So first to send something that's just using the URL and uh, post file fields to, to send the payload, that's just a normal curl use with the plugin. I mean, the, the other one here with connect is a little bit different because um, this is a uh, long running query. So we start a curl query that runs for minutes, maybe for an hour, whatever, until the server kicks us out and we keep a connection. So we put in the URL, we, we can define a script, oh, let's see, duplicate uh, we can define a script um, that runs when the connection is finished or when the transfer is finished and a script to run when we get some data with MQTT and then we run perform a sync which runs it in the background and the script ends. So the script ends when we start it and then we eventually get a received script trigger and there the parameter is a curl uh, object reference and we can ask for the QTT messages with, which I package currently as a um, um, JSON array. So you can just go through the JSON array and ask for what's in the JSON and get the values and put them in records. And eventually finished may be called if the server kicks us out and so we can clean up and maybe reconnect again. We'll see if it works um, or if more, more functionality is needed. Um, then we recently had a, a request uh, to work on Python. Python is, well, yet another programming language and we can embed it in the, in the plugin. So the first thing is you need to install Python. So we have here a script to, to load the library. I installed Python on my Mac with Homebrew, so I get a Python framework somewhere on disk in a specific version, so the path needs to change if I get a new version. Um, you may have Python somewhere in a folder you distribute with your FileMaker solution maybe, could be a local installation, like just have a folder with Python libraries and models. Uh, on Windows, I just used the normal installer and it put it uh, somewhere in the AppData folder. So we can load that. On Linux, I just installed uh, the packages with the package manager and then uh, I can just point to the library in the global library path. Uh, the system will find it. When, once we have the library loaded, um, we can um, use it. Like here I have a um, little calculation, 1 plus 2, and Python can evaluate it. Let's, let's see the script. And just uh, if Python is loaded, um, we can ask for the version. Yeah, we can make a new Python environment, uh, which basically allows you to have different environments with different local variables. And um, we can add, uh, we can evaluate something, just pass in the, the code, it will run. 
we also uh, can add our own custom functions. So I have an evaluate function to call back to FileMaker to evaluate something or a SQL function to call back as well. And we collect all the print commands. So if you print something in Python to the console, we will just collect that uh, and you can ask for the text. So let's go here through the examples. Um, here we have a script. So we have two ways. You can evaluate or you can run a script. Both are possible and a uh, script have as intention. So uh, here x is 1. If x is 1, then we print it. And uh, so we get, get the answer in our print log. Then here we can evaluate something and call back to FileMaker to get things like an account name. Um, the idea here was that you can decide whether you want to have such a function or not. So it's up to you. And uh, you can decide what's the name of the function. So um, whatever you like. And um, the execute SQL function will give back uh, here lists of lists. So this is uh, not serialized as a big text block. So it's structured and uh, Python can do something with it. And here's it's. It looks like JSON, uh, but it's not. It's not JSON. It's. It's just lists of values, and uh, if you are, let's uh, just add a number field. What is evil? Is there? Uh, here. It's here. No, it's. So that's a number field, and um, so we get here a number. So it's either number or, or text currently. So um, here we define a function and run it. So, so you can have functions defined in, in Python code. You can import models. Um, if, you, if Python knows where it is, where the models are, you can just import them. Um, let's run the script here. Calculates the power of uh, you can also uh, make syntax errors. The plugin uh, doesn't just crash. Uh, we catch the error, we report it back here. So it prints out uh, the same messages uh, Python would print in the command line. And here another little script importing a mass function. Um, here some random model use. Um, a switch command. Just got a few examples here, and let's see what we else have. Ah, a loop. So uh, be aware that um, if you run a script currently, it, it runs the road script. So please don't put in an endless loop. Uh, we'll see if we make more functions, like uh, I already got a request to run a script on disk, so without loading it um, directly. And maybe we could have something like um, run the next five lines or so, so we could um, maybe make it more interactive. So, and here's another um, another use of the execute SQL function with parameters, like we have here question mark in the SQL, and then we use uh, FM evaluate to get the primary key of the current record. So we can actually get the date of this record uh, in the database. So parameters are possible with a, with a SQL function. And uh, we can use the input function. So normally the input function would ask you to type something on the keyboard. But because uh, running the script um, doesn't have input, so we have a way for you to provide a list of input values to the plugin. and. Uh, then the input function will just pull a, a, a value from this list and give it back to you. So I can even run it twice here. And so it will pull the first, then the second value. And if your script needs some input, you could provide that with the plugin. Do you have any questions about Python? Uh, yeah, it's here on the bottom. Uh, it asks for the uh, version string. 
Yeah, please try. Let me know what's missing. Maybe some more functions. Uh, You can install Python anywhere. You can just carry it as a folder to your computer. You tell the plugin to load the DLL <laughs> from the folder, and you have all your models in the folder. So that is a virtual environment to some kind. Um, we may need to maybe add a function or two to um, maybe set some environment variables, uh, like uh, where is the path to the models. If, um, but normally the DLL will just look where it is and find its configuration file. And yeah, well, I would just run the ping command in the shell. So, oh, it isn't. Yeah, um, for the hops, we would need the trace root command, I think. No? Trace root. When you just want to know um, the response time, you can just use our curl functions to make a connection and uh, say connect only and then see how long it takes. Um, you can run the trace root command, of course, with the plugin here, with the shell functions. Yeah. Uh, let me just run the terminal example. This is an example which looks like a terminal, works like a terminal. <laughs> So basically, it should run the same thing here. Yeah. Takes a while. We are in Berlin, my server is in Cologne. Yeah, well, this is just uh, the output we collect in a text field. Yeah. So you can run whatever command line utilities you like with the plugin. You can run it interactively. You can even plan, provide um, more input at any time. So. So when you when you get the plugin. Um, you get uh, 600 uh, example files, 652 coming with the plugin, so you have a lot of things to check. Um, and let's just go through a few of the recently added examples, unless you have other questions. For example, I had a customer at the Spanish conference asking me if we could have nice poker bars in a portal. It seems to be difficult. Uh, as you may need pictures, and you maybe have some globals with pictures pre-made, but I thought about we could make the pictures with a plugin. And uh, so you could have something like a field where you put in the number, and whenever you change the number, the graphic changes itself. You could have a field to put in the color, either as a text or maybe hex encoded. Could that work server side? Yeah. That works server side. We have two ways. We have a script here and a calculation. So the script, uh, uh, this one here. So it's basically using our graphics magic functions to create a picture, draw the line, and then put it in a container field. So the picture is created on the fly by a script trigger based on the field here. So whenever it changes, we can update the graphics and um, because we like, uh, we, we also have a field, portals, yeah. There is a calculation which is basically the script translated one by one to, to a calculation to do the same thing. So, um, in this case, we make a new picture. It's currently a 300 by 30, which should be enough that if you show it in a, in a container field, which is maybe 150 pixel wide, that it uh, gets shrinked down and you have the double the resolution. 
uh, we start with our white prefix here. Uh, the auto color allows you to have the color based on the value. So it's between red and blue, a gradient. Um, then we, we set the color, we ask for the color, we actually split the color here into RGB values because we then make the background color, um, no, the background bar color, uh, a darker color based on the color for the foreground. And then we just draw two lines. We draw the background line, we draw the foreground line, and then we save it as a PNG. You mean the, the background fill? Yeah, well, here, the darker portion and the lighter portion. Now, the thing with the portal is um, that you can't use a web viewer oh, yeah. to fake it, yeah? yeah. Um, and the customer really likes to have it uh, in a portal. Yeah, yeah. So, so, you could, of course, have some table where you have um, pre-made pictures and then just reference them based on the value. But I think this is a, a better way. <laughs> so, and it's not needing new functions, it's just uh, reusing existing functions to do something nice. So, um, you have uh, some site loaded in a web viewer and you can ask the plugin to just give me a picture of that. Well, the plugin would draw it, uh, record it in a picture, or to make a PDF. And um, this is uh, this is a full PDF, one page for the whole <coughs> website. But there's also uh, the function to print to. Oh, that's not in this example. Okay, then let's just add it. So uh, instead of render PDF, we say print print a file. And uh, our web viewer is uh, named web. On the path, let's say, it uses uh, CS desktop test PDF. Okay, so run it. Okay, get yeah, an okay back. And the plugin uh, started a print session to have um, the web view print itself into a file or disk. And this works on Mac and Windows. And we have a couple of configuration things, like you can define how much margins you want, things like that. Uh, if you want duplex or you want, uh, so let's let's go to the documentation for that. Uh, I have a lot of customer who um, use the web viewer to maybe load an invoice as a HTML document and then make the PDF. The quality? I mean, this is just like loading it in Safari and using Command P to print to a file. So you get all the pictures in the full resolution and uh, the text is selected. You can use all the CSS you like uh, to, to format it. And um, here you have some print parameters, including uh, things like whether to actually print uh, the background pictures. So usually you have a fancy website, it's, it's colored, and when you print it, you want to have most things white. So. so you have a couple of options here, parameters for iOS, parameters for Windows, parameters for MacOS, like uh, defining a, a custom paper size here, paper width and paper high, so you can print to whatever size you need, uh, use the margins you need, Maybe disable uh, the printing of the background or enable it, whatever you prefer. So, and I have different uses for that. Uh, originally, there was an, uh, a lawyer who wanted to preserve the state of the website as he saw it. So, he wanted to have basically a printout in his database uh, how the website looked at that day. And then he went there every week to, to show how it changed. So, um, let, yeah, welcome. Uh, let, me, let me see another example, for example. Um, how about uh, some Dyna PDF? Uh, and have you seen the thing about book creation? So, 
This is basically um, the MBS plugin um, making uh, a book from text in, in records. Also a very nice example. So it automatically makes a table of contents? Yeah, here. Yeah. And you can click on it and it jumps to the right position. And this is multi-page output with a plugin. Uh, let's, let's just go in the script and, and show you. So with standard PDF, we have all those possibilities we want, but you have to write script lines. You can't just use a layout in FileMaker. So in this case, we create a table. Oh, this is a table object. Oh, where's my PDF? Uh, yeah, this is a table in Dyna PDF. Uh, let me just enable here the, the things for the border. So Dyna PDF has a possibility to uh, to make oops, to have tables used for formatting. There's a drawing error. So um, so we, we uh, built the table on the start. Uh, we loop through all the things to make. Yeah, this makes a table page, uh, the, the, the title page first. And then we, we loop over the records. If each record may have a PDF, it may have some text. So we actually make text for it. And we create, a, we fill in a row in the, in the table of contents table. Uh, to add it, we also add a bookmark. So this PDF also has bookmarks here for the chapters. Oh, no, no, for this here, table of contents. So we, we build that too. And you can also have FileMaker make the PDF, load it in Dyna PDF, and then add things like links, add things like here yeah, bookmarks for a table of contents yourself. Um, so uh, we generate text and we use here we, we use here white f text function to get the formatted text into the PDF and we set a text ranger act angel and let uh, Dyna PDF uh, format the text and here on the when we create the content pages we uh, where is it we allow uh, Dyna PDF to make new pages, and this is an expression running whenever a page is full. So Dyna PDF gets 10 pages of text. It just draws it on one page, then sees the box is full. It calls our, our uh, expression here, which then uh, starts a new page and defines where to continue on the new page. And so we can output several uh, pages of text with, with one line here. And you can decide whether you want to use the formatting commands from Dyna PDF or you want to convert style text from FileMaker into, into the uh, Dyna PDF commands. And then on the end, uh, it goes back to the first page. Um, yeah, edit, edit uh, the page where the index is starting and then draw as many pages of indexes as needed. So we on the beginning, we uh, put in some dummy pages for the index. So we calculate how many we would need, and then uh, we can um, just draw the table over several pages. Again here, we draw a piece of the table, then if we have more, we end the page, make a new page, um, and draw more of the table. And uh, here's the loop for adding page numbers. That's also something you can do with standard PDF. You can just merge several PDFs and then make page numbers from the beginning to the end on top of it. And maybe draw a barcode, ISBN number. And on the end, we can, we can save it as a PDF document. Oh, hyperlinks. Oh, well, we have a web link function. No, it's not used here. We have uh, cell actions. So let's see where is it. So we, we connect an action here, and where's the action coming from? We we create a named destination. A named destination is uh, some place on in the PDF document where you like to jump later. So we create a named destination. Uh, pointing to, to the page number. 
and then we connect uh, this um, this action with uh, with a cell in the table. So when you click on the cell table, it jumps to the page. So this is not a, a link directly. It's not a web link. It's it's an internal link. Yeah, internal link okay. with it. And because it's a, a named destination, we can point to it before creating it. So it doesn't need to be created. Uh, so you can first right. make a table of contents and then add the documents and create the destinations. That's wonderful. So. Because uh, PDFs are usually uh, built page after page, so you don't go and in the pages in between. You just append them. So that's a wonderful example I made for a customer, and they can now create uh, PDFs from their uh, database. So let's let's show me your, uh, uh, a similar example. Uh, where was that? Yeah, the Dynamic PDF folder. We have this page layouting example. That's for another client. They have a database uh, with a ton of, um, what was it, houses. So they need to create flyers automatically for all their offerings. And so they want to make these PDFs by script at night automatically. <laughs> well, you, you imagine if they are trading houses, they, they have a lot of um, real, est real estate here. Yeah. A real estate broker. So um, they have pictures in the database, they have text pieces, they have a headline, and this is all created on the fly with Dyna PDF, so they can have different text, different things. You could add a table if you want to use our table functions. Um, the text is in the record, like here, this is one big text with a description of the house, maybe and a few pictures, and it automatically builds a PDF. And I made this example to show that it's possible. So let's see. Uh, it just writes here header, and this is white using white style text. So we can have here the formatting in FileMaker, and let me just change the color here of a word, and run it through, and you see the, the color is included. That makes it very easy for them because they can style whatever they like in FileMaker. Then we can place pictures and we use a clipping pass to have the picture getting uh, round rect angels, as you may have noticed here, round rect angels. Makes it look nice. Uh, we place the left and the right picture and then we draw uh, here the big L character. So, oops, where's my key? There's my key. Um, here, this L here is uh, drawn extra. And then we have several boxes of text. So we have a, a header box of text, second, fourth, next page. Let me show you the boxes. So here you see all the boxes of the text, which are filled by Dyna PDF one after the other. So when one box is full, we switch to the next box and then to the next box and all with one drawing command. So we set the text right into, and we have this expression here. So I, I love to have the plugin oops, called let statements. So it, it just counts up the section and then uh, each se section has this um, variables for left, top, with right, so we know the position of the right angel and we can just count up and put more and more text into into the next rect angle. So uh, we can digitally sign your PDF, but the problem is usually um, that the other service will, yeah, well, well you can have a certificate from a trusted vendor um, to s digitally sign your PDF, but then a court, a court may still uh, complain that maybe you're, you switched your timing of, of the of the computer to sign it back. Um, so the, the key thing with uh, signing with an external thing is that they uh, are trustworthy, that they have the correct time, and uh, they didn't mess up. Um, so technically we can sign, yeah? <laughs> but the question is if, if they trust you that you actually, uh, that the timestamp is, <laughs> is correct. So with all the Dynapedia functions, it's 
for doing 100 PDFs at night automatically every day. So you don't need to, to care about it. So we automate things. Uh, this is to make the PDFs automated. We also have the sign uh, thing. Um, so let's see. Um, going back on the on the website. Um, so Dyna PDF sign. So you can have a signature field, so people can then sign in Adobe Reader. And here we have all these different save and sign functions. You bring a Pika CS12 certificate file um, to, to sign it. Um, also, we have uh, the version on Windows uh, using Windows uh, Crypt functions, which allows you to have your certificate in the Windows um, store. They have a, like, like the keychain on Mac, they have a database for all your certificates. And this also allows you to use a certificate on USB stick uh, with its own time, so it's more trustful. But you can technically sign a PDF with that, and then people can open the PDF in Adobe Reader and see, yes, it's uh, signed and it hasn't been modified. We have here our little toolbox to check if something syntax is OK or uh, to format uh, the, fa the text, if I select, uh, and you can uh, run it. If, if, if I select a chunk of, of text, uh, yeah. you, uh, now I can select one. Uh, I can, I think, press Shift key, Shift run, and get the one. Okay. This so it, you, this is new in the last beta, I think. Mm -hmm. So you can uh, just have here a, a P selected, and then you press the Shift key. And uh, I can also press the option key here to format it compact, and then yeah. so you can you can work on the calculation and shift key run and well the RTF functions don't handle pictures as far as I know because um, having a picture in RTF is um, an extension by the vendors. So Microsoft has a way to do it, Apple has a way to do it, Linux has a way to do it. Uh, it's not as, it seems to be not in the standard. Um, okay. For Word, for Word, we have indeed some, some functions. Um, uh, plugins. Again, uh, Word. And we have some functions, and uh, people can uh, can load a template, and then they can replace a picture here by replacing the media file. So I know I have a few customers who like to make Word documents automatically, and um, they may use several templates. So they have a template for uh, for one picture, for no picture, for two pictures, and they just replace it. Um, the problem we have often is that uh, someone asks for a Word file because they want to edit it after. So the database exports uh, whatever, the invoice, the offer, whatever, as a Word file, and then they want to write additional text on it. And then we say, uh, please put this text in the database because otherwise nobody knows what you wrote there. Like, if you gave the customer a discount and you wrote it only on the Word file, the database doesn't know about it. Yeah. So. I would say talk to them, get it data in the database, and then make a PDF. So what, what else do we have on nice examples? Um, yeah, if you, if you want to work with Excel documents, so um, the plugin can read and write Excel documents with LibXL, and we can... Uh, make conditional formatting. So let's see, here example one, we create a new XML uh, book, we add a sheet, we write some text and cells, and new in the last version of the plugin is you can add a conditional formatting. So the formatting is not predefined by setting formatting in the script, but we, we set the conditions here and say the condition is, um, yeah, add rule. So there is a rule with different modes, and one is beginning with and beginning with an A, and then we apply uh, here the bold font, 
and this gives us uh, this example here. So the nice thing is, instead of just having it all predefined in a template, you can define a, a conditional formatting on the fly in your script. And I have a lot of customers <coughs> that um, do their Excel exports not with a FileMaker built in Excel export, but with a plugin by, for example, loading a template file, uh, getting the numbers in FileMaker, writing the numbers in the cells, and then saving the document. Or you do the export in FileMaker and then load it in the plugin and modify it, like putting in uh, the column names you like, instead of having field names there. Or otherwise, you get an Excel document, you may load it with a plugin, you may uh, pass uh, the values in there. Like we have uh, another function here uh, to quickly read things. Matrix. So you can open a document, you can read all the cells into a matrix, which is the data structure of the plugin. And then you can ask the plugin to give you the data as CSV if you want, but also the matrix allows you to just insert it into records. So insert records. So you could have um, an Excel document to read a thousand lines with 10 values each into a matrix and then have one call to create records at FileMaker. Well, it's something you specify, and the default is here a new line and semicolon, but if you like tabs, you can pass in tabs. So uh, we have, a uh, usually we put it into quotes automatically if it contains some special character, yeah, but like a semicolon. And here is a flag, as one to put all text values in quotes. Um, oh, okay. The great thing with the plugin is we have 7,000 functions and you can combine them. So someone thought about, oh, we could have the Excel functions combined with the matrix function combined with SQL functions to read in an Excel document and push it to a SQLite database. Why not? So what else? Uh, so conditional formatting, we have a few more examples. You can try, play with them. Mm. What else do we have? People from Switzerland may be happy to know that we can make uh, QR codes for the invoices. Also possible with uh, here European invoices, so you people can just uh, scan the barcode and make a transaction. Um, oh, data detectors, also a nice function. Um, you may have noticed that on, on a Mac, if you have an email message containing some values, you can just uh, move the mouse over the link and you can click the link or the address, you can click the address. And um, this is using data detectors, a feature in the Apple Frameworks, and we can use that in FileMaker. And you can get the values as a JSON, or you can make an action menu so based on the data in the text, we offer here actions, like copy the phone number or call it, or you know, open the link, uh, open the address in uh, Google Maps or Apple Maps. And this is something you can just copy to your solution. The, you know, here, uh, um, there's just a, a script to build a menu based on what the data detector found. So this is just, uh, and it uses our menu commands to, to show the custom menu. And this is a button you can, uh, with a script, you can just copy to your solution next to a field and then uh, have those actions on a, on a Mac. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I thought we, we had a live stream some time ago where we just showed people around some things. Um, oh, if you are using Windows and uh, you are so sorry to not have a search box, uh, I mean, get a Mac here. Yeah. Um, but but we made something for we made something for the Windows people here. So uh, if you open this file, it registers a hotkey F8, 
to perform a search. And it does that by copying the current script. So let's see. Um, hot key was, uh, what was hot key? Uh, F8. Um, so it, it copies all the lines to get an XML, and then it makes records in, in this database. And now you can search here. Uh, what could I search? Uh, records. Um, and it finds me the line numbers uh, of the records. And then I can go back to the script workspace and, and find the line number here. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it shows you the XML behind. So. Yeah, you can use it on a Mac, I see. This is a database to help people on Windows to search in their scripts because they don't have a search box. No, no, not for Zipa. We have uh, IBAN verification yeah. functions. That, that's something I have. And we have this creation of a barcode. Yeah. We have this uh, QR code to send money here yeah. in, in Europe. So thank you all for coming. And, uh,